Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Wu University's wonderful presentation tonight, Eyelid Hygiene from Office Education and Product Dispensing to Increasing Patient Compliance at Home. We're joined tonight by Dr. Elise Kramer. Hello. I will be your host tonight. I'm Dr. Jennifer Stewart, and I will be hosting and moderating tonight's event. It is my great pleasure to introduce a co-moderator of WooU. Uh, Dr. Kramer is a residency trained optometrist in Miami, Florida, who specializes in ocular surface disease and specialty contact lens design and fitting. Her doctorate degree was awarded in optometry from the University of Montreal in 2012. She went on to complete her residency at the Miami VA Medical Center. Her time there included training at the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute, the nation's top eye hospital. After her residency, she became a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society and now serves as a secretary for the SLS. She's a member of the AOA, the International Association of Contact Lens Educators, a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and of the British Contact Lens Association. She's a delegate of the International Relations for the Italian Association of Scleral Lenses. She's published several important articles and reviews and participates in clinical research trials. She enjoys lecturing all around the world in several different languages, I didn't know that, uh, about ocular surface disease and specialty lenses. And we are super honored to be with her here tonight. What languages do you present in? Tonight we're gonna do it in English, but um, all, all of the languages I speak, which we'll talk about another time, but French, English, French. Very um, cool. I learn something every, every time I do this. So, but tonight's in English, so. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Um, these are my financial disclosures and all financial relationships have been mitigated. Um, all right, so we're gonna talk about eyelid health, eyelid hygiene, what that means. Um, eyelid hygiene in the sense of routine cleansing and massage of the eyelid is well accepted in the management of many disorders of the eyelid. But I'm going to propose a broader concept that may be more appropriate in which eyelid cleansing is more of a complete program, which basically includes uh, not just eyelid cleansing, but also screening, risk assessment, patient education, and also coaching. And all of these aspects are super important to really get our patients to be compliant with the treatments. Um, and for them to really understand what's going on and understanding leads to compliance. And I'll talk a lot about that tonight. So the healthy human eyelid is remarkable, but to be honest, it's a very neglected structure in general. And this is why it, it's such a hot topic now, because it's like, we're discovering all these new things about the eyelid now. So in anatomy and physiology, um, basically, we know that the eyelid is adapted to a number of specific functions, basically, which are crucial to the health of the eye, which basically includes the protection of the vulnerable ocular surface, right, from physical insult and providing a lubricated and hydrated environment um, for movement of the eyelid and smooth surface, basically the gliding of the eyelid over um, the ocular surface. And basically that is what is going to lead to optimal visual. So in 2007, the dry eye workshop defined the lacrimal, the lacrimal functional unit as an integrated structure comprising the lacrimal glands, ocular surface, which is the cornea, conjunctiva, meibomian glands, eyelids, and the sensory and motor nerves that connect them. This concept basically gives rise to the functional system, okay? And basically from there, we understand its important role in maintaining the health of the exterior optical surface. And with that, we're also protecting the vision. So the healthy eyelid basically comprises lamellar structure um, with fine skin on the outer surface and conjunctiva on the inner surface, as we can see here. And between these layers lie a number of muscle groups, which we know about, um, basically, which control the movement of the eyelid, the blink reflex, which is super important, and also the tarsal plate, which we know comprises and contains the meibomian glands. So the cornea we know is actually the most fragile external structure of the body. 
And it relies entirely on the eyelid and the adjacent structures to maintain its transparency, to maintain its patency, and a cornea directly and permanently exposed to the environment will rapidly develop epithelial defects, scarring, vascularization, and infection. Um, and that is gonna be experienced by our patients as irritation, pain, loss of visual acuity, and eventually, if it's not treated, loss of sight. So as with many ophthalmic disorders, even a small degree of dysfunction can have very significant impacts on the quality of life and the ability to carry out normal daily tasks by our patients. So let's talk about all of these things here. Meibomian gland dysfunction, anterior blepharitis, dry eye syndrome, allergies, dermatological conditions and contact lenses, all of these are interacting pathologies. Why? Because they can all be a cause or they can be a consequence of all of each other, right? So they all interact. And so we know that my bone gland dysfunction and inflammation are pathophysiological processes that can cause many of the illnesses that you see here. And so all of these can be intertwined and all of these are going to be involved in our hygiene protocols and our health protocols when it comes to eyelid hygiene. So when we look at the eyelid in, in clinic, in the office, we want to express the glands. And one of the things that you'll notice when you start doing this is that the consistency of the my bum, which is coming out, is not always the same. My bum is something that we want to be liquid. We want it to spread over the ocular surface. And what it does is it provides a protective layer over the ocular surface, preventing evaporation of the tears. But as you can see in these photos that I've put up here, you can see that the consistency is quite solid, it's pasty, and actually this is called the toothpaste sign. So look for this because this will indicate that the mybum, the quality of the mybum is not what it should be. And if it's not manually expressed, it won't come out on its own. And likely if the patient is not experiencing symptoms, they're at least having tear film instability, which will eventually lead to symptoms if it's not treated. So how do we express meibomian glands? Well, these are two different ways of doing it in the office. What you can see above is the meibomian gland evaluator by J&J. &J. And what this does is it actually just gently put it on the eyelid and you can see whether the opening or the orifice of the meibomian gland opens up and releases oil. If it does that, then it is patent, it is working, it is functioning properly. The bottom photo will show you the consistency, so the, the makeup of that meibum when you squeeze it out. So you can see in the photo, this toothpaste sign. So basically completely two different ways of doing gland expression, but both give you a lot of information. The one on top gives you information as to whether the orifice is open versus blocked. And the bottom one will give you information as to the quality of the mybum that is being secreted. The other thing that we can do in the office, which is so useful and probably one of my favorite things to do on patients who complain of dryness, who have symptoms of evaporative dry eye, is to do in-office mybography gland imaging. This has been described for so many years. Basically, people used to do transillumination, as you can see on the top right photo, just to see the meibomian glands or whether there was loss. So this has been a concept that has existed for a long time, and we're finally able to put it into fancy equipment that we can get. And there's many different devices that you can obtain into your office, um, some smaller, bigger, and basically these will show you images, infrared images of the patient's meibomian glands, which allow you to visualize the meibomian glands to see if you have any loss, as you can see in the top right, on uh, top left video. And also my, one of my favorite things about mybography is the ability to show these images to patients so that they understand what's going on, understand why you're treating uh, their condition and why you're being so um, quote unquote aggressive about it or proactive about it. Um, and, and again, understanding leads to compliance, right? The other thing that's so important is to look at the eyelids. So eyelids are a convenient location, we know, for staphylococci and demodex mite. 
So if we look at looking at cholerex is really simple with a slit lamp and you should just make it part of every eye exam, honestly. On the left are some images of what you would typically see if a patient was just looking straight ahead and the same patient looking straight ahead with a lid lift on the bottom left. But you can see um, when the patient looks down, how easily you can visualize those collarettes. So if you're the type of practitioner who works a lot with contact lenses, you're probably frequently asking your patients to look down because you want to look at that upper edge of the lens. But if you're not frequently applying contact lenses, then you might not be asking your patients to look down, but it's super easy. It adds no chair time. And you can really see in these images um, how easy we can see the collarettes. We can also see some misdirected missing lashes, which are all indicative of demodex blepharitis. So please try this in your practice. When I first started looking for collarettes, I was amazed at how often I saw them. And I think this is just really important to provide the best care possible to our patients. So let's get into a little bit of Greek mythology. So hygiene, health, what is the difference, right? Hygieia was the daughter of a Greek god of medicine uh, whose name was Asclepios. And like her sister, Panacea, she followed uh, her father into medicine, but her she was specifically in charge of prevention of illness and promotion of health. So those two things are what hygiene are. Okay, so although um, there is a very obscure distinction between hygiene and health, the concept of hygiene commonly refers to really the prevention of disease via practices in normal daily life. So things that you can do at home, basically treatment of, um, of, of risk factors for disease rather than the disease itself. So now in modern medicine, uh, the hygiene implies the promotion of health through prevention of infection with cleaning regimens, right? So although cleaning is an important part, as I mentioned before, um, again, we're looking at a wider concept, which includes screening a patient, patient education, and in, in the case of eyelid hygiene, warming, massage, and cleansing routines. So it's not just cleaning anymore. Now we're incorporating heat treatments, we're incorporating massages, and a, a, a host of other things that patients can do um, to complete, really have an overall uh, complete hygiene protocol. Let's talk about dentists for a minute because they really have had this for a long time. This is, and honestly, the, the analogy between eyelid health and dental health, it's impossible not to think of, right? So we've seen, we've all seen these images of, of teeth and we know how to understand what a cavity looks like. We see a little shadow, we see a little hypofluorescence, hyperfluorescence, and see these are things that we're used to looking at uh, since we're young, right? And so basically dentists just have been doing this for so long. They identify issues, they show it to us, um, and, and they have us do cleaning at home cleaning our teeth, regular screening. Um, and basically these are all to prevent gum problems. And basically the, these are also what they're going to do is they're going to offer things in the office that we can do procedures, interventions, things that we can buy products um, like toothpaste, like electric toothbrushes, um, interdental sticks, different things that we can do at home in order to prevent conditions such as gum disease, cavities, different things like that. So basically when we talk about eyelid health, this is the same thing. So we're showing pictures to our patients of my bombing gland dropout or my bombing gland dysfunction or my bombing gland blockage. And we're trying to improve their compliance with hygiene protocols that we're recommending. We can also show if you have slit lamp images, you can show images of cholerets images of deposits in the eyelashes as well. But basically we're giving patients a photo documentation of the issue, which will allow them to basically, or encourage them to accept these daily hygiene regimes and treatment interventions that they're doing. So why is hygiene so important? Why is this, yes, okay, the symptoms of the disorders are unpleasant, right? Some cases are debilitating patients. Uh, this may affect their quality of life, 
Absolutely. But what we're also worried about is more serious site-threatening conditions if it's left untreated. Actually, blepharitis has been reported in as many as 60 patients who are about to go undergo cataract surgery. And our biggest fear after cataract surgery is endophthalmitis. And the number one culprit in endophthalmitis, post-op endophthalmitis, is staphylococcus, right? And so that comes from blepharitis. That comes from anterior blepharitis, um, from not performing or not adequately performing eyelid hygiene prior to surgery. So these are things that should be identified prior to cataract surgery, prior to any intraocular uh, surgery in order to prevent any serious infections, right? Of course, we want the hygiene to be better. We want to prevent meibomian gland loss. We want to improve patient symptoms, but we really do want to prevent site loss. And this is something real, and this is something preventable. And so very important as well, right? To avoid serious, serious issues. So let's come to education now. Education is key. Um, it is so important for maintaining a healthy tear film. Um, basically, it, educating patients about eyelid health um, and overall eyelid health will help with long-term and even lifelong compliance, right? So patients can be instructed on how to clean, on how to massage the eyelids, on how to avoid different exacerbating factors, but most of all, just continue cleaning, massages, routine, follow-ups, when to come back, and basically the recommendation of various products that are really important in order to achieve these results. And that's where we come in. We're going to be the one recommending products. And one thing that really gets to me is, is baby shampoo, because honestly, I, I hear this, I still hear this today, and it still happens. Actually, one of my staff members um, was answering a phone call and someone asked her how to clean her eyelids and she actually recommended baby shampoo. So I don't, you know, obviously I spoke to her about it, but this is something that people still recommend. So first of all, let's talk about this. Soap and water washing does not have the effect on bacterial colonization of the eyelids that might be expected. Okay. And also the other thing about baby shampoo and soap is that it actually can uh, destroy the tear film lipid layer. Think about it. These soaps are supposed to get rid of oil. They're supposed to get rid of any type of lipid. And so they can actually harm the lipid layer of the tear film. So this is completely counterproductive. Yes, it might clean, you know, um, the de some deposits on the eyelid, but if it gets in the eye, yes, it might not cause any tears, but it will actually destroy the lipid layer. So this is not a good idea. Please do not recommend this. It is harmful to the lipid layer. So what do we look for in an ideal eyelid cleanser? Basically, we want it to effectively remove eyelid crusts, right? We want clinical improvement. If it works, it's going to be great because patients will continue doing it. We want it to be pleasant and easy to use because if it's pleasant and easy to use, it's going to encourage long-term compliance. And we want it to have no preservative, parabens, perfume, or if it has to have preservatives, then we want it to be low toxicity, um, a low toxicity alternative, because we want to avoid any side effects from this type of treatment, right? We want it to be smooth for the patient. We want it to be easy. So there was a two week study actually on Sjogren's syndrome patients, which showed that um, the addition of eyelid hygiene regimen actually decreased um, corneal epithelial permeability more than tear lubricants alone. So this helps even Sjogren's syndrome patients and not just patients who um, have evaporative dry eye. So eyelid hygiene can also help remove allergens from the lid margin, uh, which decrease their access to the conjunctiva and effectively removes crust and debris from the eyelid margin, which reduces the possibility of bacterial infections and helps reduce the negative effects on the meibomian gland. So remember how all those, um, those conditions interact. So 
if we reduce enter blepharitis, we can actually reduce negative effect on my bulbing glands, reduce the risk of my bulbing gland dropout, which is irreversible. So very important to choose the right eyelid cleanser. What about eyelid massages, right? So this is something that um, we've heard of for sure, um, but it does help. Um, in addition to cleaning done in combination with massage of the eyelid, it has multifactorial benefits on the function of, uh, on everything, the lacrimal functional unit, which basically encourages the expression of myeblum, especially from blocked or partially blocked meibomian glands, which have, as I showed you, thicker, more waxy myeblum. And basically this is really helpful if the eyelids are actually warmed during the process. So if we get that myeblum out, again, that will lead to uh, the meibomian glands producing normal myeblum again, which will lead to better tear film stability, which will reduce inflammation, which will basically interrupt the dry eye vicious cycle, which we've learned about many times. So cleaning with massage has shown to be effective, more effective than just cleaning alone. Um, remembering to massage with every cleaning is important. There are a number of techniques for eyelid massage, um, but basically the massage should go uh, from the root of the eyelid to the margin using a warm compress or a gentle pinching action. We don't want patients rubbing their eyes, obviously. We don't want them to think that they're having to rub because that could be detrimental. We absolutely just want them to gently massage, especially after the, the eyelids have been opened. So there are a lot of different products on the market, um, but long-term hygiene needs to fulfill a number of criteria, as I mentioned. So eyelid cleansing products exist in a variety of presentations, as you can see here, but basically there's solutions for dissolving crusts. There are gels uh, that encourage mechanical removal, and there's also ready to use pads and foams. So it's important case by case, there is no product that works for every single patient, just like there is no contact lens that works for every patient, just like there's no, everything has to be custom fitted to the patient. Basically you look at the patient, discuss with them, their lifestyle, how they are, what their daily activities are. Yes, this might take a little bit more time than just your 10, 15 minute eye exam, but it's so important because if you find a product that works for your patient and you can show it to them, and give it to them in the office, they will use it and they may stick with the product for a lifetime. So it's definitely worth it to understand your patient's needs and find and recommend a product for them, specifically for them. So let's talk about different active ingredients that we find in our products, right? So hypochlorous acid, which has been shown to be an effective treatment for killing bacteria and controlling biofilms around the eye, is very common uh, to find this in a lot of products. It can also help with allergies. And actually, Avanova pioneered the use of hypochlorous acid, which is a stable and pure solution for around the eye. And then we also have hydration wipes, which help reduce dry skin associated with itchy, irritated, and inflamed eyelids. Hyaluronic acid and glycerin wipes, such as this one by iMed Pharma, are great for hydrating dry and sensitive skin. And then we have eyelid wipes with tea tree oil as well, such as Clearidex, which offer a natural preservative uh, free way to clean the eyelashes and also the face to relieve symptoms of MGD, rosacea and dry eyes. These form, uh, products are formulated with a uh, four terpenol from tea tree oil. And we know that terpene, terpenin for all is actually toxic to Demodex. So this works quite well. Um, obviously this is something that they have to keep doing. So we're excited for new treatments in the pipeline. Um, uh, for Demodex, but this works really well right now. Just make sure that they're not getting tea tree oil inside the eye because that does hurt. I know from personal experience, uh, when I got tea tree oil in my eye, it was not fun. So make sure that the patients you are recommending tea tree oil to um, are, are not getting this in their actual eye. This is a fun little device back, it uh, looks a little bit like something a dentist would prescribe back to our dental 
uh, model, um, but this is actually an eyelid device. Um, basically, it is a eyelid cleaning device that one can do at home. Um, you can actually also do it with the eye open. It is safe. It is effective. Um, and you're, they're using a little bit of gel there uh, and, and removing the crust and debris and, and all the deposits and colorettes on the eyelid. So um, a very good treatment for patients who have a lot of buildup. I do have quite a few patients using this as well. So let's talk about warm compresses. So the objective of eyelid cleansing, as I mentioned, is not only to remove crust and debris from the skin, but also to express my bum, right? So we're talking about cleaning. We're not just talking about the superficial eyelashes and, and colorettes. We're also talking about the my bum. And I've been talking about my bum since the beginning of the presentation because it's so important. It comes from the meibomian glands. Um, they could be partially, they could be completely blocked or obstructed by thicker than normal or waxy kind of uh, uh, consistency, right? So warm compresses are good. Uh, they will differ depending on what product you're using. Um, again, tailoring this to your patient, asking your patients um, their lifestyle and if this is something that they can do. Basically, you're taking a hot or not too damp compress or face cloth um, and it should be held against the closed eye for around five minutes. I usually tell my patients 10 minutes because if they do five, they're actually gonna do two. So you know how patients are, just always ask them to do more rather than less. But basically this is also gonna loosen scales on the eyelid margin and improve the fluidity of the my bum. But I, there are so many better treatments today than hot compresses. This is a great treatment. It's so much better than nothing but there are so many devices now that we have in the office that we can do. And these are so good. So my problem with hot compresses is that after two minutes, okay, I'm going to go back to the slide, but after two minutes, um, the, the temperature rapidly decreases, right? You put it in the microwave, it's all hot. It's great. But two minutes later, the temperature is not what it was. These treatments here, obviously with the exception of IPL, which is a different uh, type of treatment stimulating the meibomian glands, but the ones that heat, so the top, the, the bottom left, the top right, and the top left, these are all treatments that heat the meibomian glands. They maintain a stable temperature for the entire treatment. Okay, so we know that what happens in meibomian gland dysfunction is the meibum actually increases its melting point, right? And that's why it doesn't come out as easily. It becomes solid, right? So it increases the melting point to higher than the temperature of the eyelid. So we want to warm up the eyelid. But again, hot compresses, that temperature just doesn't stay for the full five minutes. It certainly doesn't stay for 10 minutes. Actually, studies show that in order to do a hot compress properly, you would have to switch that hot compress every two minutes. So it's so much better to do a treatment in the office because it's way more effective. All these treatments are FDA approved, which means that they have been shown in head-to-head -head study against a warm compress to be significantly better right, to be more effective. And that's what we want. We want something to be effective. And a lot of these treatments have to be repeated only once or twice a year in order to have the desired effect. The other thing is that a hot compress will heat up the entire eye while you're wearing it. Whereas these devices like Lipaflow, Tear Care, Mibaflow, these devices will only heat the exact location we want them to heat. They will only heat the eyelids. For example, in the lip flow, you can see that activator, how it, it really just protects the ocular surface. There's absolutely no heat getting to the cornea, right? And it's kind of counterproductive to heat up something that is already inflamed, right? So what we really want to do is heat the meibomian glands and not the ocular surface. And these treatments just work so much better to do that. So I highly encourage you to recommend these treatments to your patients. If you have them in your office, recommend them over hot compress, but obviously hot compress is much better than doing nothing. It just has to be done often. Um, it has to be done at least twice a day in order to be effective. So this is something uh, fun that I like to give my patients. It sounds silly, but it's really not. 
Um, if you go to a Starbucks and go see a millennial on their laptop, you will be shocked at how li little they're blinking in front of their laptop. And it's true. It's we're supposed to blink about 12 to 15 times a minute. And people sometimes don't even blink once, maybe two, three times a minute. Um, and what happens is, first of all, that causes solidification of the my bum. But more importantly, even if the my bum is the consistency is fine, it's not going to be released because the eyelid is not closing properly. There is no blink. And a lot of the time, and I encourage you to ask your patients to blink at the slit lamp to see that a lot of them are blinking incompletely. And it's that complete blink that is actually going to release the my bum. So it's so important to go over blinking, even though this is supposed to be an involuntary movement, it is actually something that we can be aware of, increase and also improve. So there are apps for this actually, and this is a blinking exercise form uh, that you can get from Tear Science. Um, and I highly recommend uh, you to give it to your patients because it is just a reminder. Another thing I have my patients do actually to remind them to blink is I have them leave like an, a preservative free artificial tear next to their computer. So not only does that act as something, oh yeah, I have to put in my artificial tears now, but it's also something that reminds them to blink when they see it. So it, it's a good thing to tell your patients to do that. If they're contact lens wear, preservative free, I recommend preservative free to everyone. Um, but yeah, you know, artificial tears, especially preservative free ones are, are is something that you can use all day. Um, and so just have them leave it next to their computer. So after I do perform a treatment in the office, I give my patients this checklist and I check off everything I want them to do. Everyone is different, right? It depends if they have evaporative dry eye, if they have um, aqueous deficient dry eye, maybe they're a mix, right? Maybe they're wearing contact lenses. Um, and it, again, you have to tailor your treatments to the patient. There is no formula that works for every single patient. Some patients need to wear a sleep mask because they have nocturnal lug off almost. Uh, some patients have a ventilator over their bed. Ask these questions. A lot of patients are working all day on their screen um, and blinking exercises. These are all things that I'll recommend. And I'm going to show you this short video of me um, talking about dispensing products in the office, which will be the next part of the presentation. I'm uh, Dr. Elise Kramer, and I am an optometrist. I specialize in ocular surface disease, dry eye, uh, specialty contact lenses, and I work here in the Weston and Miami Contact Lens Institute in South Florida. Being a dry eye expert, basically, and um, partnering with Dry Eye Rescue has definitely increased awareness um, in my office in dry eye with patients. It's improved compliance because I have all the products. I have the displays and patients, when they come in the office, they feel like they're in a dry eye clinic. So a lot of patients will look up dry eye. They'll come here and they'll feel like they're in the right place because of the aesthetic that dry eye rescue provides for the office. And um, allowing all the inventory to be available to patients online to be able to get their products and also return for their follow-ups regularly. So in terms of awareness, yes, I do believe that Dry Eye Rescue has helped me increase awareness among my staff and also my patients for Dry Eye. So these displays, talk to Dry Eye Rescue about these displays. This is something that you can put in your practice. It does increase awareness when people walk in and they see that. Um, they actually feel like they are in a dry eye practice. They see the inventory. These are things that they may not find at their local pharmacy, right? These are things that, um, that, that you can put in your office that make it just look way more like a dry eye practice. And you can display um, some items and you can keep other items in inventory. Um, I love this. Uh, this has really changed my practice, so I highly recommend it. Another thing that Dry Eye Rescue offers is a tear pad. 
So on this tear pad, you can see the front and the back. So you get a 10% off code for your patients just by being a patient at your office. They can go online, put in that code and get 10% off all the products that they put in their cart. And that tear pad that you see there on the back, you can actually customize it with the products that you recommend for your patients in general. So there could be many different ones, but the ones that you most frequently prescribe or recommend, and then you can actually circle them so that your patients, when they go home, they know what to look for. So these are products, again, that you can dispense in your office, that you can show to your patients, and when they get home, you show them how to replenish it once they run out, because not every patient is going to come back to your office to purchase the product. A lot of patients are going to need new products, are going to, they are going to run out, right? Maybe not of hot compresses, but of foams or um, pads, cleaning pads, of sprays, of eye drops and different things like that. So this um, website has everything on it and it allows you to show your patients what to get and how to get it and even how to get a discount. So highly recommend this uh, for your practice and uh, it's really a no brainer. So let's talk about uh, again, education. Patients need uh, education to understand their disorder. Um, this is an encouragement to persist with daily eyelid hygiene. If a patient understands the underlying mechanism of eyelid cleaning and massage, they're definitely more likely to comply with it. And these are two of our kick-ass colleagues down there uh, educating their patients. I found these images online and I love them because they're in action, showing patients um, images of their meibomian glands versus the scale. Uh, you can get a scale like that with uh, the, the meibomian glands uh, showing a full you know, set of glands and then um, mild to moderate uh, dropout and then severe dropout. Uh, and that really, really helps just to show your patients where they stand in terms of meibomian gland health and where, you know, what, what the next steps are. Eyelid hygiene can also be considered as a preventative means, uh, of course, to, pre to maintain eyelid health. So hygiene leads to health, right? Hygiene and health are not the same thing. Hygiene is, is preventing and health is the goal, right? And, and follow-up is important. So we talked about education. Every patient is different. I've said that so many times, but it's so true. There's nothing that works for everyone and it's important to tailor the, the treatment. So I showed this uh, type of spreadsheet. I have a spreadsheet like this, which I share with my manager. And I put the name of the patient down. If I do a treatment, um, I write down the date. Um, and then I'd write down what is the treatment plan? How often do I want to follow them up? I actually have my staff member call the patients the next day after the treatments because I myself really like that when I get a treatment somewhere um, that's maybe a little bit invasive. I really like um, getting a call the next day to see how I'm doing. And so that's something that we started doing and our patients do appreciate it because maybe they're not always feeling 100%. Maybe they have a question. Maybe there's a product that they forgot to get or they lost and they need to get it um, and they need help. So they may have questions. It really doesn't take long and it's just going an extra step. So I highly recommend that. But basically the most important part of this is what's the next treatment plan? How often do you want to see the patient? And so this is my guideline. You don't have to follow this, whatever works for you, but this is what I do in my practice. If they're mild, I feel comfortable following a patient every eight to 12 months. If they're more moderate, um, I'll follow them uh, every four to six months or so. If they're severe, one to three months. And if they're undergoing a flare, if they have a flare right now, I might follow them weekly or even more because they are really just suffering and they and they need uh, a lot of attention and maybe multiple treatments. So um, it, it depends again on the severity and this is just a rough guideline. You can pick what works for you for your workflow with your patients, but um, this has worked really, really well for me. So in conclusion, um, eye care practitioners play a really important role uh, to play in, in, in helping patients persist with routine eyelid care. Um, and these things are long-term, they might even be lifelong. And 
Uh, a number of preparations exist to make a uh, routine eyelid care both effective and more pleasant and improve compliance. And patients need help. They really do need help in selecting the most appropriate eye care products to assist their daily regime. So definitely show them the products, show them how to get it, display it in your office, keep it in your office, and definitely show them how to obtain it once they run out. Um, another thing I want to mention is a lot of uh, Dry Eye Rescue also does offer subscriptions. So you can have patients just get their orders every month or every three months or so. And so this has worked really, really well for my patients. Um, so I, I'm just going through some of the questions now and I see if I recommend uh, preservative-free artificial tears instead of something like Blink for contacts, absolutely 100%. I can't say this um, enough times, nothing with preservatives. So we see the negative effects of preservatives um, by just uh, our glaucoma patients, right? Um, and, and seeing how, uh, how much ocular surface disease they have just because of uh, a lot of the, the, the preservatives in their glaucoma drops. These are drops that I want my patients to feel comfortable using with or without their contact lenses. And so there's absolutely no preservatives. Um, I have lately heard some people are afraid of the bottles, the preservative-free bottles, just based on all that scare that we had earlier this year um, with those all those recalls. Um, in that case, just have them use single use containers. Uh, we've had those for years and those are, are really great. Um, so yes, preservative free, long story short. 